Valentine's Day. What are you doing for it? Me? What corporate America wants you to? Or are you eating ass? Like every other day. I'm chowing a butt. How come there's no eat ass Valentine's Day campaign? Hallmark wants to make some money. Put out some shit about eating ass, man. Like two, eat two stuffed animals. One of them's fucking mouth magnetizes to the other one's ass. You know what I mean? Rump chow. That's the way to go. Eating ass is popular. Man, I... Sorry, dude. Can you turn my headphones up more? That's my fault. Now that I'm listening, it's much more quiet. And now we're back. Much more quiet. Let's get it. Get it. Get it. Get it. (coughs) There we go. Yeah, that's a lot better. (coughs) I like to drown out everything else. Let's see here. By eating ass? (laughs) No original soundproofing. (laughs) (laughs) The fucking pound proofing. <laughs> pound proof. Sucking on a boner. Sorry. <laughs> you, you gotta talk while I fucking get this loaded up. You're gonna spit it out, dude. <laughs> Sucking on a boner. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Fuck, dude. I did. I'm about to spew that shit all over the table. <laughs> Oh my lord, I need this sword. It's made of white meat. I hope everybody's doing all right out there. We're going to be showing our cocks tonight on the, the live feed. <laughs> <laughs> it was showing wings. <laughs> we're show our dicks. No. We're probably going to take it right down. <laughs> uh, they probably keep it up in our case. Like, oh, that's what you want to show? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Let them see it. <laughs> you don't give a fuck. Let's see your future. Oh, fucking summer sausages. That's all we got. <laughs> uh, I hate this part of this shit. Uh, let's get this fucking going. Skiddle do papi la do. Skiddle on ding on ding on ding. You're not helping out, buddy. I, I <coughs> it. Oh, God. <coughs> How are you still coughing, man? Because, man. It's gross. It's just like a goddamn water bomb. Well, it's Life been like three weeks, man. You're gonna fucking yeah. die, dude. Um, here we are, YouTube live. We're gonna record a podcast. You know how it goes. To the one person watching, hell yeah. <laughs> we gotta rebuild our twenty YouTube watchers up from the ground now, dude. Yeah. Uh, oh, man. Yeah. Well. I don't think there's much to talk about before we do the podcast. Anything you want to say that's not going to be on the podcast? No. Okay. No, 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 no. Yeah, get your shit together, man. Get closer. Well, I had it the way I wanted it. <laughs> well, with the, you don't know a fucking thing, man. <laughs> You're dumb. <laughs> dumb. Dumb, dumb, and dumb, full of dumb, dumb, dumb. Fix these shits real quick, like. Man, this is gonna be a good podcast. You know what I mean? I'm excited. I'm just ready to do it. That's a guy. It's a cool. It's it's gonna be fun, man. Doing the old Kentucky tie-in for the next episode. They're like the same thing, but not. It's gonna be fun to see if I can pull it off. And if I don't, (laughs) who gives a shit? You know what I mean? Nobody cares about anything we do. About anything anyone does. They don't give a fuck. They want to watch us die. Man, I would tune into that. Just that? <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> By me, I guess I'll be there. I will make sure you see it if I can. If I know I'm going to go and I have a chance to make a video out of it. Lasting legacy. Yeah. Just checking audio. No, that's good, man. Let's do this shit. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, we can do it. We'll come in with our sweet fucking tune right when... Uh, uh, okay, yeah, give me one second. All right. Chomping on a pig muff. Made of leather so it's real tough. It sure ain't, ain't kosher. kosher. Don't, Don't tell my boner. boner. DMD Saturday night. Welcome to Death Metal Deluxe. Hell yeah. Back again. For that ass. Valentine's Day week. You been having a good one? You fucking freaks. Yeah, you know you uh, haven't been, you nerdy Man, nasties. I hope you guys have been eating ass. Chowing it. 
Um, uh, you know, if guys, you can't be tough if you don't eat muff. Ladies, you can't be tough if you don't eat muff. Plowing. You gotta eat ass. It's 2018. If you're not licking your partner's butt, what the fuck are you doing out there? You can't make nobody sound like no fucking farm animal if you ain't eating their ass. Yeah, quit being boring. Oink, oink, Live a little bit. It sounds gross because you were conditioned by Puritan values not to chow ass. That's the whole thing. You gotta overcome it. Be your own person. Eat that fucking muffler. You know what I'm saying? Here we are again. Another episode. You know how we do things here. Death metal dicks. We find terrible true crimes. Compare them to fantastic death metal songs. Sometimes conspiracy theories. This week, my guy. A little of both. Really? It's going to be a two-parter. And first, we're going to talk about the new Bedford Highway Killings. This is one of the nation's biggest streaks of unsolved murders. Now, you've heard of the Zodiac Killer. Yeah. You've heard of some other unsolved murders. Mm -hmm. This one doesn't get much mention. But there's 11 dead women, and no one's answered for it. Hmm. That's a lot. It's a lot. That's a lot. A lot. We're going to see if we can get to the bottom of this shit. New Bedford, Massachusetts, 1988. In a six-month span, nine bodies turn up, and two women from the same background remain missing to this day. 30 years later, a handful of suspects are dead or in prison on other charges, and in this two-part, we may blow this goddamn thing wide open with a supernatural twist that's going to blow your tits off. All right. Before we get to that, business time. You know what I mean? Business. First of all, we love you guys. We do. Very much appreciate you listening to this podcast. Mm -hmm. It means a lot. We love it. I jack off to the numbers that come in. I jack off to what he comes out. <laughs> uh, you know, if you enjoy it, something that would really helps us out. It's simple and it's free. It sounds dumb because it's so easy. Get into iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts, preferably iTunes, <laughs> and give us yeah. a five-star rating and then type a little blurb in there. It could be anything. You don't have to tell us we're cool. You can take a shit on us. Yeah. You can say, fuck Sam Talent. You can bully Sam Talent on our feed. You can say your favorite type of coffee. We don't care, man. Just please help. Any words in there, and it helps us tremendously. It just, iTunes has some weird algorithm, and the only way to breach that motherfucker is to have interactions. And what interactions are, are rates and reviews. It's dumb, but thank you guys who have done it. We got a bunch last week. Again, helps tremendously. We have some friends of the show that want to help so much and are so gracious that they contribute to us via Patreon. And you can visit patreon.com backslash death metal dicks. We have several different tiers with clever names that you can subscribe to and get things from us. In other words, we sell ourselves for cash. Mm -hmm. In fact, this episode, buddy, is a patron's request. I know. Isn't that great? That's it's cool good. as hell. That's and it's a cool-ass case. You know, yeah. we took a suggestion. I started looking into it. Was blown the hell away. Our good friend, Ryan Parker, he's a patron. And one of the tiers, one of the rewards is... You get to pick a crime or event that we cover, and this one was fucking awesome. So if that's something you're into, get into that. And also, if you wanted to pick the song that we compare murder with, we got up that up there too. So check that out. If you don't like Patreon, the whole subscription thing, I get that. Any dime, nickel, dollar helps us out tremendously. We got goals, trying to get a website up, trying to get shirts, trying to tour, all these things are not us spending money on sandwiches. It's us building this so we can give you more stuff. That's all. Yeah. And if you don't like the subscription service, you can certainly reach out to us on PayPal. Several have, and we thank you so much for it. Uh, deathmetaldicks at gmail.com. If you want to Venmo it, just uh, hit me up. We'll take it all, and we certainly appreciate it. And at the end of the show, we're going to shout out all of our awesome patrons who have done it so far. And we're gonna love y'all till the dawn of time. We're gonna treat y'all like hogs and swine. <laughs> <laughs> we're a real pig mood, you know what I mean? Yeah. 
And we're going to go to New Bedford, Massachusetts this week. Not a huge town, the sixth largest in Massachusetts, population of about 95,000. Now, New Bedford from the start was the most important whaling port in the world once it got established, which is a dead art. You can't kill whales in America anymore. And I don't see why. Because they're big, they probably are delicious, and fuck whales. You know what I mean? Why do people love whales so much? They're dumb. It's a big, stupid piece of meat. Yeah. What's going on with the fucking love for whales? It's the cow of... Not the- feeling the whales. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, Here's the deal, man. There's several classifications. I listened to another podcast this week that was all about marine life, and there is a... Uh, Whoa, you must have been bored. <laughs> yeah. Fucking hey, man. It just happens. I drive an hour each way to work, and sometimes I podcast it. Guys, I forget that I could just listen to music instead. <laughs> But they're, t- uh, they're orcas, killer whales. No one wants to hear that. Killer whales are smart as fuck, you know? They got languages, codes, they move in packs. But then there's dumb fucking whales like belugas. They're just stupid as shit. And uh, there should be a line. If it's smart, yeah, don't kill it. If it's a dolphin, some cool thing that does cool stuff, and you can tell that they talk to each other, Leave that boy alone. If it's a big, dumb, steak-carrying fat fuck of the ocean, let him rip. It's like the cow of the ocean. Yeah, I don't. I think that's uh, manatees, my guy. Manatees? Manatees. Hmm. <laughs> uh, thoughts, my buddy. Uh, I don't know why I just went on a whale tangent, but kill him. That's what I say. <laughs> that's all over with, but it still remains a pretty well-to-do northeastern town. There's a lot of fishing there, so <laughs> you have a lot of Portuguese fishermen that have moved to town because of the sea-bound industry. Big Portuguese community. You've got a lot of locals who live there there's a huge medical community that's in town you know like the hospital staffing phone calls all that type of shit that's not directly hospitals that every other town has that's what people are up to in new bedford lots of money going around everyone's got a pretty nice house it's not exactly a shithole but of course there is a seedy side to new bedford there's lots of drugs in massachusetts in general everyone i know from massachusetts save since the opiate crisis, if you would call it, has begun, even in the 80s, they've had huge opiate problems. Heroin, banging pills, something about the Northeast. It's dark, gloomy, and you also have a lot of physical jobs there. So people get broken, beat up, and then they have to keep working every day, and they start taking pain pills. And then pain pills get too expensive, and heroin is readily available in the area. So just the type of lifestyle you have there lends to a lot of drug use. So around the time that all these crimes took place, the underbelly of New Bedford lended to regular small town activity, methamphetamine, heroin, prostitution, you know what I mean? Chowder. Chowder. Hard-working... Middle class life. We ran out of white chowder. We ran out of white chowder. We go down to favorite beer tavern down there and we just get our chowders. The uh, New England clam chowder is white, right? I don't, yeah, I guess. And this then is all chowder, dude. One of them. What's, what's red? What's the other option? Red. It's not just red clam chowder. I don't know. You can mix it together and make like a vodka sauce for it. Shut up. What's. <laughs> God. I don't even know why I talk to you. <laughs> But yeah, so we're in the 1980s, man, and uh, everyone's living a pretty cool life, so it's one of those sleepy places in America where there's not a ton of crime. The crimes you're looking at, again, are going to be things that are kind of drug-related. And when I say drug-related, it's it's larceny, breaking and entering, people trying to get small amounts of money to get their fix of drugs. So you don't have murder, you don't have lots of rape, prostitution, grand theft auto, shit of that nature. Good old-fashioned Saturday night fun. (laughs) Property theft, all that's going down. So it came as quite a shock to the New Bedford Police Department when they got a phone call about a missing body. Not a missing body, a found body of a missing person. Imagine a missing body would be like if someone got taken into the morgue, I guess. Yeah. And then uh, Jimmy the mortician took that thing home to fuck it for a while. Yeah. 
Maybe your ID's in here. I think about this all the time because there was another mortician that got busted boning a corpse last week. Damn. I, but that, how much does that happen? That's got to happen. A oh, lot. you know what it was? It was a guy in Australia, a reality show star died. They took her body to the morgue and he smashed that shit, you know? Oh, yeah, man. It's not like the bodies. I don't know. I've Let me not defend necrophilia on our podcast, but what's the big deal? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, think about it too. It's like, man, I mean, they're dead. And Not shit. to go back to whales, but I'm sure, like, that pussy feels like a whale pussy because it's all cold and old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've never been in a cold hole before. <laughs> oh, God. Well, uh, the fleshlight not warmed up. I got to put that boy in the freezer for a while and see what's good. Yeah. I, was like, I mean, the oil stuff in it is it just like slow moving when it's cold. The you flashlight? Want, yeah, man. You got one at the same time as me. Oh no, I didn't. I was. Yes, I did. sat in the car. I was. Oh, like, you I didn't get not one? doing this shit. Yeah. Uh, I think the statute of limitations has passed, so I could just tell this story <laughs> on the podcast. Man. <laughs> so one time we take a swig of this wine real yeah, quick, man. man. I'm gonna <laughs> drink the rest of it. <laughs> I don't think oh, we found man. it all. Mm. God damn. Uh, so one time uh, we were on the road. Me, buddy, and a couple of our friends who I won't incriminate because I'm cool. Yeah. And uh, we went into a porn store. I can't remember exactly why. Well, this is what happened, man. We <laughs> All right. <laughs> Fill me in. I was sitting in the passenger seat. All right. The two other dudes are in the back here driving. And then uh, one of them gets a bright idea and goes, hey, man, we should just fucking do a heist for flashlights." <laughs> that was the idea. Are you sure? Yeah. And then, I thought it and just then we're like, then you go. Man, we're on the highway, dude. I'm sure if we just take a side road, we'll find a porn store. And I was like, yeah, I mean, 100% you're going to. This is dumb as fuck. You do. The first road you take has a porn store. You back up into the parking lot. I go, I'm not getting out of the car. <laughs> this is fucking dumb, man. I thought you got like an alien looking one, dude. No. You sure? No, because you guys, <laughs> when you guys come back out. I'm just like, because I had the car started, and I was just like, man, you motherfuckers come running out of there like yeah. the building's on fire and shit, and then you get in the car, and then everybody's breaking that shit open like a Christmas present. You laughing. Know, you know how, like, giggling, you, you, like they had their advertisements laughter. inside of a package? <laughs> yeah. So they had, like, the different ones, and they had, like, right. an alien pussy one, and oh. then you're like, man, look at this, and then, <laughs> and that's when we came up with the bung tongue the same day, because I was yeah, like, man. Yeah, all right. So we get a bung tongue, and it's the thing that just licks your butthole for you. Yeah, and then we're talking about we can get a cat tongue because it's all scratchy. <laughs> yeah, bung tongues are cool, dude. We got a sh- we, so we need to take a good picture of our bung tongue tattoos because me and Buddy have matching tattoos. <laughs> Mine says bung, his says tongue. <laughs> <laughs> we got bung buses. <laughs> and yeah, it's it's all based on uh, the idea that instead of a flashlight, you have a synthetic tongue that licks your asshole clean. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, but anyway, so my side of the story, we go into the store, me and my two friends, and. Uh, there's no one around. There's just not someone there. And right as you walk in, there's a giant display of flashlights. And I guess that's what we premeditated coming in there for. So it was just destiny. Yeah. And we're giggling <laughs> in the store. <laughs> and we all three grabbed a flashlight and skedaddled and fucking had the best time ever. And man, I still got that thing. That was a goddamn seven years ago. Yeah, man, it's been a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember being like, man. The only problem with it, dude, is I probably used it maybe eight times or so. Yeah. And, uh,. One time I used it, came in it, and left it there for, oh, my. <laughs> probably two years, man. A long fucking time, dude. What the fuck? <laughs> and so I put it in the dishwasher and uh, ran that boy through and then uh, fucked it again and did the same thing. <laughs> and then it's got cum in it right now, actually. Now that I think about it, dude. <laughs> oh, oh, my. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> it smells too, man. Like it gets like a real hot vinegar. And that's how you make prison must. liquor. <laughs> <laughs> prison Here's party liquor, man. Old cum. <laughs> oh fuck! <laughs> well, this even happened. <laughs> we were talking about. Oh yeah, um, necrophilia. Yeah. I just uh, I don't get the I don't see the big deal. Yeah. Just I get guess one it's of just those disrespecting and... the dead. Or th- they can't say no. You know? Yeah. Like a- yeah, I mean, a body can't consent, but it's a body, too, and it, it depends on what your beliefs are. If you're a goddamn Christian, I've said goddamn too many times. I'm using it like a, uh, gotta stop that shit, you know? No. You gotta recognize the faults in yourself and improve upon them. But if you're a Christian, the belief is that when you die, soul leaves the body, body's insignificant. It doesn't matter at all. It's just a meat vessel. For your soul to be in until you die and go on to your more permanent residence of heaven, which is way better. You never needed the body. It was actually imperfect. So who cares if someone pounds it? 
Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's a, it's a who cares situation until Chuck Bannister from Kentucky fucking crime labs takes that motherfucker home and pounds that shit. Yeah. Yeah, and they do, man. I just, well, yeah, I, I'm not defending it. I just saying it happens. I know what happens more than you hear about. Those boys, you got to be weird to be a mortician. Yeah. You were going to be a mortician. I was, man. I mean, you weren't going to, but you thought, you thought that you it's would It's just like one to. of those, like, it was an idea. Pea brained ideas. Yeah. Oh, you know why? Mortician? Because I, I was listening to the band <laughs> Mortician. mortician. I was like, yeah, I'm just going to do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to do that. Sounds cool. Oh, that's yeah. a job. <laughs> yeah. That's for me. So, back to the crime. <laughs> they are, police are alerted of a body. Deborah Medeiros, 30 years old. She was last seen in New Bedford, May 1988, after ending a relationship with her boyfriend. This is the first body to be found in the sink of things. And she was found two months later, July of 1988, about 30 feet from the road on northbound I-40 in Freetown, Massachusetts. A motorist who had stopped to piss, a lady, on a Sunday of the July 4th weekend came upon a partially clothed, unrecognizable corpse, bra around her neck, and investigators that she called, what she called 911, investigators showed up on the scene, and they could, of course, tell that the body had been there for months. And that's not exactly breaking police work yeah now full confessional for this episode i didn't uh write all my own notes on uh the victims i just printed them off yeah <laughs> that's fine right Who yeah cares? Shit. Shit. Just, shit. i was going to but it, it, uh, i found a article that told more of what happened and another thing about the murders here um again we got this idea from our patient ryan parker normally when we do a serial killer I can find how each person was murdered. I'm wondering if because it's unsolved, they didn't release a lot of details. But again, this is from 1988. Yeah. You would think it would be public information, but I could not find how they were all <coughs> killed. Weird. Yeah, they're probably. Just, yeah. I mean, maybe they're just trying to figure it out. You know, they usually right. don't give you all the information. So whenever the actual information comes from a different source, they're like, okay, we got our guy. Yeah, no, but well, you know, they did, we've talked about in basically every serial killer thing that we've done in West Memphis Three, how detectives will intentionally withhold a yeah. lot of information because if they do catch the actual killer and they speak with them, they can catch them in little traps, like put stuff out there, leading questions to try to get the alleged killer to admit things that hasn't been leaked out into the news. So that gives them an idea of if they know about the crime more than everyone else knows which gives police ammunition you yeah. know because as we know from solving murders it's extremely tough when you don't have physical evidence so we're, even though we're in the late 80s it's going to come into play and i'll talk about it a little bit how we're the technology to test dna is there but it is still not it's um, new it's, it's in new. its infancy right for sure. it's not and it's not a go-to thing for police departments and there's a lot of politics involved in this um, you'll hear this, the same DA's name come up over and over again when I get into the list of potential suspects. And just a DA is an elected office. You have to run for it. You get elected. And a lot of times DA's will run on the platform of solving a particular crime. The DA that's in office will run on the platform of being an incumbent and they need to get this thing solved. Just like a president with a war. Yeah. You know, presidents that are... Well, first of all, most presidents that are elected, if they want to do two terms, are going to. But it's like 100% if you're in a war and the second election comes around. It's the same thing with every politician. If there's a major media event that you can latch on to and use to continue your political career, they're all, they'll all do it. You yeah. know, it's it, even though... You're an attorney. You're still a politician at, when it comes to the point of election, right? Yeah. So that's going to come up a little bit. Um, the second body, or oh, I deated. Mm. I do this shit all the time because I'll forget, and then I think I pause for four hours, and then I come back, and it was two seconds. That's yep. Adderall, man. When I take one and come in, I'm moving fast. So anytime I pause, I do that shit when I'm doing uh, stand up too. Like I'll, I'll think that I pause for a whole hour and say something else, and then go back, and it was l not even a second. <laughs> it's like I stopped saying words. 
fuck my ass. Yeah. Got to move this along. All right, so we're just going to go in order. We got Robin Bobby Lynn Rhodes. She was last seen in New Bedford April 1988 by her mother. She was found March 28, 1989, along Route 140 southbound in Freetown by a search dog. She had a young child that was addicted to heroin and cocaine. While she was never involved in prostitution, she did hang out at the same saloons and in the company, the same company as uh, three of the other women, and she was good friends with another one of the women. Now, I should have prefaced this before when I was talking about drugs and prostitution. This is that circle. So everyone that comes in missing really ties in with one suspect immensely. But again, this is all going on in a working class. This is a working class township, yeah. you know? And so there's a group of people that all hang out together. And so when I'm saying these women are prostitutes, I mean, they're sex workers. So it's not a, I'm not demeaning what they're doing. And in this type of town, it's not even like a full-time job. It just is opportunistic because you, you hang out at the same places as everyone else. Everyone that's doing the same drugs that you are living this type of party lifestyle and into the sad end of, of partying lifestyle. Yeah. Everyone wants the same shit. It's hard to get money to pay for it. And if somebody wants to have sex with you and you don't want to have sex with them, but you could be convinced with money that could buy drugs or you could be convinced with drugs. I see no problem with it whatsoever. Yeah. I'm with prostitution. I mean, we said it before. It's absurd that it's illegal. I mean, why can you go pay for a massage Butt naked, getting your butt cheeks rubbed, and not and that's not even a sexual thing. I mean, a dude, it, it's not it's not sexual at all, but just the there's not that much of a degree of separation. Yeah, and to make that illegal, it just compounds problems. The same thing with drugs. Same None of this shit drugs. would have happened if both of these things were legal. So again, these aren't full time street walking prostitutes. They're just opportunity prostitutes. Yeah, and uh, I guess a better word is sex worker. You know, yeah, because. Uh, if it comes up, it comes up. But everyone kind of knows each other because, again, only 95,000 people in town. These are the people that move in that circle. Next body that's found, Rochelle Clifford Dopperilla. Wow. Butchering that name. That sounds like a fucking hamburger helper. <laughs> yeah, Dopperilla. <laughs> Here's an real Italian ass hamburger uh, helper for you. Dopperilla. She was 28. She was last seen in New Bedford late April 1988, found December 10th in a gravel pit along Reed Road, which is about two miles from Interstate I-95. Two hunters were riding ATVs, and uh, this was the only body that was not found directly off of Highway 140. She was a mother of two. Rochelle had been a witness in a case against a man named Roger Swire who had raped her. He was being brought up by police on weapons charges, and she was last seen with Nancy Pavia's boyfriend, an ex-convict, and uh, this dude was cleared in both deaths. And uh, the suspects are going to blow our mind. There's super shitty police work I can't wait to get into, but we're going to get on to the victims. Uh, Deborah Lynn McConnell, she was 25, Last seen by her father in New Bedford, May 1988, at a cemetery after they had buried his wife and mother. The family grew worried when she did not call her 10-year-old daughter on her birthday. She was found December 1st off of Route 140, northbound in Freetown, also through a canine search. These aren't fun to go through, but again... It's important to understand the climate of what's going on, because it's the same type of person... Lots of them are mothers, so they're all reported missing. It's super sad, man. This whole thing's sad. The Northeast depresses me in general. Yeah. It's always shit like this, man. It's always a fucked community from drugs, opiates. Yeah. Christine Montiero, 19. She was last seen in New Bedford late May 1988. <clears throat> Her body was never found. Her mother was engaged to a Dartmouth police officer, which is where our friend Ryan lives. Christine had a young child and was known to use both heroin and cocaine. Marilyn Roberts, 34 years old, last seen in New Bedford, 
June 1988, her body was never found. She was the daughter of a retired New Bedford police officer. She had a supportive family who was who consistently tried to help her with her heroin addiction. Her family originally believed she had moved to the West Coast to live with a relative, but they later learned that she had not been in touch with any of her relatives. After they heard about a possible serial murder in the area, they reported her missing, and that was all the way in December. She was neighbors with... Christine Montanero, and in 1998, her mother said that they're trying to get on with their lives, and she just wishes she had a grave to visit. She really doesn't know what happened, and it looks like she never will. You know, sad. Shit. Families just want closure. That's yeah. something we've noticed in almost every case. Now, I, I couldn't tell you from experience, never had a missing person, but in a, other scenarios in life, it's always better to just know what the hell happened? You know, when you got that feeling in the pit of your stomach, like some shit's going to happen, you just want to find out, get it over with. Yeah. You know, pull the bandaid off. It's going to suck. But being left with questions and mysteries, I'm going to fuck every day of your life up. Fuck yeah, man. Fuck yeah. Nancy Pavia, aka Pena, 36 years old. She was last seen in New Bedford, July 7th, 1988 after walking in the south end in the early hours. She was found on the westbound side of Interstate I-95 in Dartmouth on July 30th by two men on motorcycles. She was also a mother, two girls. She had graduated high school and went to a very good secretarial school in the area, but dropped out in the 1970s. She got married at 19 and had a daughter named Jill. She got divorced and then had a second daughter, Jolene. Nancy was also a grandmother with her daughter pregnant at 15 and had two and she had two kids of her own. Her family says she was a very supportive mother and grandmother and Pavia's family denies that she was ever involved in prostitution and there was no arrest records on her for solicitation, but they do say that she was in a very difficult domestic violence situation with a heroin dealer named Frankie and she had been in rehab for heroin several times in the past. Almost impossible to kick. Yeah. In 1988, 1998, her daughter, Jolene Pavia, who was 14 years old, was talking about her mother. Um, and, you know, at 14, she also had her own daughter, Perpetual Cycle, Northeast. And uh, she wishes her daughter could have seen her, she says, but she tries not to think about it. She looks at it as she has to stay strong for her daughter, so she tries to block it out of her mind. Her sister... The other one with the two kids, same thing, super sad. Her daughters are now age 10 and 11, and uh, she says, this is a little fucked up. She says, when my kids say, you're mean, I think of my mother and how we were in bed at 8 o'clock, and we would see other kids outside playing, and their mother would tell them she didn't care what the other kids were doing. She wanted, she wanted to watch out for us and make sure we did good. And both of these girls apparently went on to college, Jill is now working in a doctor's office as a medical secretary, and Jolene got an associate's degree in criminal justice and is volunteering at a local district court. Good for them. That's awesome. And uh, the, the two daughters have done a lot to get the investigation underway. I mean, that's a lot of this that we're going to see is shitty police work, and it's also, you got to stay on top of the police. I mean, uh, I doubt you've seen it, but I'm sure most people listening have seen that three billboards outside ebbing missouri and uh it's all about that you know there was a murder and then i'm not going to spoil it because it's pretty new but if you have seen it you know that the lady i think it's a true story but the lady had to light a fire under the police department's fucking ass to get anything done yeah and that happens sometimes man and it sounds like these two girls did that uh, detectives cook took this case seriously when her boyfriend, the dealer, reported her missing at the police station. Police knew him well, as he had had many run-ins with police in the past and had been to his place to deal with a domestic violence situation. According to some of those present, an argument between Nancy and Frankie ensued at the Whispers Pub, a place known for cocaine and drugs. Frankie ordered Nancy to leave the bar. Nancy left. An acquaintance later said that she saw Nancy walking up the street towards her house around 7 p.m. with tears on her in her eyes. It was raining, and that's the last time anyone saw Nancy Pavia alive. What a cool neighbor. Yeah. And there's my neighbor crying and walking in the rain. God, I got to get home to watch the Patriots play at 7. You know what I'm talking about? New England. Woo, the white of the red, Ow. man. We got to get the chowders. <laughs> they got the chowder cheese dipped out of Newbanks. I'm ready. 
<laughs> your chowder cheese dip sounds incredible. <laughs> yeah, man, let's make that. Yeah, how have we not before? Yeah, man, this retarded brain works sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only good thing you've ever said on the podcast, man. <laughs> Uh, Deborah DeMilo, 35, last seen in New Bedford, July 11th, 1988. Found off the eastbound Reed Road ramp of Interstate 195 by a state highway crew. She'd escaped from a prison work release program in Rhode Island on June 18th after she received charges for prostitution. Her remains were concealed by trees and her clothes were strewn in the nearby branches. She was found with some of the belongings of Nancy Pavia. She had a 15-year-old girl and two boys aged 8 and 3. 1998, her mother said, I think about my dad who did this terrible thing. I pray to God at night that she will put an end to all this. She calls God a she. That's fun, right? Yeah. What if God was one of us? Bung tongue and all our fucking butts. <laughs> Trying to lick all our holes. Reaching all her fucking goes. <laughs> <laughs> Coming like a nasty ghost. <laughs> <laughs> ghost Jack. Yeah, man, that's a good. Uh, all right. So <laughs> I think about my dad who went and did this terrible thing. I don't know why she gets the accent, but she does. I pray to God at night and I hope we put an end to this there. But I'm not going to give up. I'm getting older, and I would like to be able to find out who did this. Her mother raised her daughter's two children. Very sad again. One has since graduated, married, and had her own two children. Another will be attending prom. I don't know when this was written, so that (laughs) Uh, crap. Probably 1992. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Uh, this is a newspaper article. We don't talk as often as we did about it, she said. And my dad is in heaven now, and I still can't bring myself to go near the cemetery at all. I drive by it there, and there are times I want to get away like I'm running away. Do way we was <laughs> I will eat a chowder bowl and turn it to chowder cheese dip and new banks. <laughs> Man, Cemetery Gates is a hell of a Pantera song. One hell of it, man. That's a new thing we should announce is we should open challenge. We'll fight you if you don't like Pantera. Yeah, we'll fucking yeah. fight you. you. You trying to be a cool motherfucker? I'm going to do my record review, but let me tell you this. Pantera sucks. Like, hey, fuck you, man. Yeah, Pantera is one of the best bands in the world. And, you're like, and I'm oh. tired. Yeah. Of them getting shit on. We're going to say it every episode until we make a change in the culture. Let's bring Pantera back. Let's make them cool again. Why did Pantera start being uncool? Where did that happen? It's just some stupid internet shit. Man, what it is. Did you hear the songs? Dude, listen. You know what it is. Everybody's like, I like deathcore. And it's like, I like breakdowns. I don't like deathcore or breakdowns. So, yeah, but you don't. But you do mm-hmm. because Pantera yeah. did all that shit. <laughs> right, 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 right. Before, right. sure, and they made it heavy as fuck. There was so there was heavy. things before that that were kind of you know whatever. But dude, those right. boys wrote hard ass songs, so hard and fun. It's the best. And you and, and like I get it. People were like upset about the whole you know. It's Phil just Anselmo. a rebel flag. Phil Anselmo's just gay. Listen, go back and listen to our interview if you skipped it because I know the interviews haven't gotten as many listens as the regular episodes, and I understand that. People get tired of interviews, but we talked to Eli Litwin of Knife, Knife the Glitter, and it was fun as hell. We talked about E-Town Concrete, talked about Pantera. Right here is the start of the movement that Phil Anselm was gay. I'm sure it's been put out there before, but I have, first of all, factual anecdotal evidence. Second of all, he's fucking gay. He's got to be, dude. <laughs> That's the whole thing. He tries way too hard to be manly, but boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, man, I know what he knows how to do. Eating fucking man's ass. Yeah, jack the shaft and chow his ass. Yeah, yeah, rusted fucking trombone, man. That's what the white power he was talking about is. It's when you hile, <laughs> you you seek hile, and then you put your face on the asshole and jack the dick this way. Whoa. That's what it is. I mean, that's a Kentucky balloon animal. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Rose Santos is number nine, 26 years old, last seen in New Bedford, July 16th, 1988. 
She was dancing down at the old quarterback lounge. What a hilarious name for a strip club. Oh, quarter deck. I was like, the quarterback quarter lounge? That's so funny, dude. That's a name for a strip club? Yeah, you know, here's what happened. I was playing football all four years of high school. It's fucking sweet, dude. I went out for 197 fucking yards my senior year. You don't know how hard that is. That's pro numbers, my man. But I did that, and then I had a freak fucking shoulder injury working construction with my nephew Ralph that summer. You remember Ralph, right? Yeah, That's man. That's what happened to me. I blew my shoulder out. I was going to go to Boston College. I was fucking Doug Flutie. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and man. And it just didn't happen out for me that way. And so now I come down to the quarterback end every single night. Well, you know. Well, we know. Shout out to Billy Blanks, cause we got those DVDs, and we got your shoulder working again, brother. Fucking right, yeah, we do. I'm gonna get that shoulder together, and then I'm gonna make a run at the pros again. I'm tired of doing drywall, but it was actually called the Quarter Deck Lounge. Uh, she was dancing at the old Quarter Deck Lounge in the early morning hours. Her husband had dropped her off earlier near the downtown bus station, and witnesses say she had planned to walk to a friend's apartment nearby before she went missing. A beer bottle was found among her remains. Santos was a mother of two and also a heroin addict. She was friends with Clifford, Pavia, and Santos. Her son was six years old when, he was, when she was murdered and spoke out 19 years later about her death. He says earlier that day he was home playing video games. His mother, about to go out for the night, asked for a kiss. That's kind of hilarious because she was going to strip. He remembers telling her no because he was playing his game and she had probably had wang in her mouth earlier and kids are smart. Yeah. Mr. Santos said his parents had just reconciled after a brief separation, big surprise there, and were planning to renew their vows. Great. At the strip club? Is that the move? Wow, Heroin's man. a wild time, dude. I mean, listen, New Bedford... Is fucking, yeah. it's like it's the fucking uh, Arkansas, dude. It's Arkansas. It's it, just a it, different. It, you know what I've learned doing comedy around, buddy? What's that? Every single place in the entire world is exactly the same. Absolutely, it's all the same. It's everything. Nothing's different. There's no different culture. People talk different ways, for sure. Every single place has got the same people doing the same shit at the same time <laughs> with the same people. Listening to the same stuff, wearing the same stuff, driving the same stuff, everywhere's the same. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're not wrong. I know, I'm right. His mother had gone out <laughs> looking for a wedding dress the day before she went missing. This is a weird life, man. Yeah. Doing heroin, stripping. Husband's not dropping you off at the strip club to go strip it at the bus station. That's like uh, all those movies where the kid doesn't want the parent to drop him off in front of the school because it's embarrassing. So they drop him off like a block away. But instead of a block away from the strip club, a block away from the bus station to ride the bus to the stripper. What's going on here? What's really good? This is like uh, <laughs> this is like the movie Jack, you know, with fucking Robin Williams. Oh, yeah, just like that. But the only difference is, is like, you know, <laughs> like, what the fuck? You know, Jack's trying to fight off fucking uh, Fran Drescher's character. And mom. she's just jacking people off. I got you this uh, fucking uh, cookie cake frosting thing. You got me. Here you go. Who was your friend? Did she die? Is that your principal? I haven't heard from Fran Drescher in a long time. No, nah, man. She's just out there fucking doing dumb shit. I, yeah, her voice. I'm really, yeah. Ugh. Terrible. Yeah. I think that started a lifelong problem for me because when people have a loud voice, it does something to the inside. Like, I get mad, but uh, you know, if something happens, high pitched women like vocals. you, uh, like you stub your toe, yeah. or you can't find your keys, or you get cut off in traffic. That's like an audible anger. You know, you feel that you're mad. When I hear a loud, high pitched voice, not necessarily just a woman. I get an anger like inside my fucking pancreas. You well, know? primarily a woman. <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, they generally have a high pitched voice. It's not that it's a woman, it's just a certain fucking octave. Like, dude, I'll tell you some real shit about having kids. When my son was first born, I wanted to throw him out of a window. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dude, it's hard, man. Having kids is a motherfucker, but. One of the hardest things is you're you're accustomed to a certain lifestyle. You sleep at certain times. Like we had our first, my daughter, dude, she rarely ever cried. And from day one, she slept the entire night. So all the things that you hear about horror stories for parents, we didn't have that. Well, my son, totally opposite of that. And when he screamed, 
It was just the highest pitch shit I'd ever heard in my entire life. I still remember that, but it like hurt my spine. It yeah. was just, I didn't want to feel bad. Like it sucked. I went through a lot mentally because I would feel so bad that that noise just made me like hurt. I think it, little boys are just fucking worse. They cry way more than girls do. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I would agree with that. Uh, well, friend Rush was pretty fucking hot. Our producer, Mark, is pulling up pictures of her and good googly moogly. And until she opens her goddamn mouth. Isn't yeah. that's, like, that's like every fucking slop. I, would like, I would like to hear her in a thrash band. No. Yeah, give me a thrash riff. It just sounds like it just sounds like violence. You're exactly right. She sounds like fucking Rob Flynn when he was in violence. All right, Sandra Bothello, 24, last seen in New Bedford. His guitar. I don't give a fuck. I hate Rob Flynn. Anything <laughs> negative I can put on Rob Flynn, I'll do it. Yeah, Look yeah. up Rob Flynn's slam poetry. I feel like we talked about this already. Oh, yeah, fuck that. Sandra Bothello, 24, last seen in New Bedford, August 11th, 1988, after leaving her apartment, found April 24th along Interstate I-195 in Marion by a state highway crew. Bothello was a college dropout and engaged in prostitution and drug use. She, of course, had two sons. Sons aged four and six. Number 11, Don Mendez, 25. Last seen in New Bedford, September 4th, 1988. Walking from her South End apartment to a family christening party. Found on November 29th on the westbound Reed Road amp off Interstate 195 by a search dog. Mendez was one of 10 children in the Mendez family. She was the mother of a five-year-old boy. She had a history of prostitution and drug use. In 1989, her mother described the last time she saw her. The last time I saw her, she was so thin, drugs were controlling her. She was out there on drugs doing what she had to do, but she was a beautiful child. She was my child, and I will always love her. She described her daughter's boyfriend... Oh, he had a spell on her. She was supporting two habits. If she did not go out there and make the money to get drugs, she'd get beat. Her mother raised Mendez's son. What's wrong with me, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> Just because somebody doesn't like their lifestyle doesn't mean they should take their life, she said. If she could have changed her lifestyle, she would have. All her torment is over now, and that's what keeps me going. What? I feel like this is a special place in America. This lady's a cunt. <laughs> Maybe not all places are the same, Chris. <laughs> I guess not, dude. All of... So she's having... To, that's what keeps me going is that her daughter died. Yes, yeah, she was addicted to the smack there. Thank God somebody came along and killed her. Oh, God. <laughs> that guy's an angel. Now, several theories as to what happened. Tune in next week to get blown off the face of the earth because I'm talking about satanic cults. Damn. UFO activity. Damn. Spooks. Damn. Specters. Damn. Werewolves. Damn. Aliens. Damn. Me jacking off four times in between now and then. That's a long wait. You can only jack off four times? Between now and then. I plan on having sex like three. Yeah. I mean, that takes a lot out of you. Between now and then, till I see you again. I'll be coming in you, also in the shower on my feet. I will rub your belly, make you think that you're preg. Then I'll spread open your fucking sweet pair of legs. legs. I want to take you to a place. Bull on out and bust some cream on, on your face. face. You a dirty pig. Ooh, you a dirty, dirty pig Eating out of trough Eating out of a big slop trough You gonna eat this chow now Eat it down, eat it down, eat it down now Don't you puke when you suck this dick You better hold it in Gonna make sure I come real quick Come here, come, 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 come Man, this is the only musical <laughs> I like <laughs> <laughs> I talked about this shit on uh, Facebook one time, but uh, that fucking La La Land movie, Jackie wanted to watch it. We turned it on, and I was like, I fucking hate musicals. 
And she got so disgusted and goes, you are a goddamn musical. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, you're right, man. <laughs> fucking a. You got a good <laughs> fucking point. <laughs> all right, so let's talk about, first of all, the suspects in the case. Because there's a lot, and uh, there's so many that could have easily done this crime. Again, I think what happened before good video technology, before the internet where people kind of kept track of themselves... And before cell phones, <laughs> where people could, the police could just pull up your phone and see exactly where you were at all, at all times. I mean, people could just get away with things for so long and would have so many different things build up. There is 10 people that could have done this murder. And easily, even though it was a short string, they could have all been friends and doing the same shit. Like, imagine that. You just have this group of fucked up dudes. One of them kills one. It's like... Do you know how easy this shit was? You wouldn't believe it. And one of them was like, man, I got to try this shit. I've been thinking about it, but I haven't done it. But now that he says it's a good idea, I'm going to fucking give it a shot. I mean, how many things do you do in your life when I try it first and it goes well and I'm like, man, this kicks ass. You got to give it a shot. Yeah, man. I do it. And vice versa. Yeah, man. You may hear a band and be like, you got to check this shit out. And I'm like, it, I thought I wouldn't like it, but buddy said he likes it. So I'm going to give it a try. Let's give it a shot. And I love it. You know? Yeah. Could have easily happened. First suspect, who, uh, this is who, again, you heard me talk about the DAs and the political side of things. The DA that was in control for most of this thought it was for sure this guy, Anthony de Grazia. Investigators have been searching for the killer for over a year. Again, DNA isn't a normal practice in the late 80s, which infinitely complicates things because there's no concrete evidence. It's all hearsay. It's all ideas. If you can't get a fingerprint because the <coughs> bodies have been out in the elements, <coughs> I can't believe you're going to fuck up another podcast by coughing. Can you get healthy, you piece of shit? I'm trying, man. I'm Eat a fucking vegetable. You know what I mean? I had salad last night. That was just yesterday. That's one vegetable in your three-week sickness. No. Yes. Yes. No. What vegetable have you eaten recently that didn't have a bread around it? Brussels sprouts. Did you have bread with that meal? No. When? Last week. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> You're disgusting, man. I hate this. Stop coughing. Uh, most of the leads and clues come via word of mouth. And since we're dealing with a seedy underbelly of New Bedford, most of the witnesses weren't exactly deemed credible by police. Make sense? They're whores, all right? They're prostitutes, okay? One of them IDs Anthony de Grazia from a lineup of pictures and say he is the flat-nosed man that assaulted her. Anthony de Grazia was later arrested after he was accused of 17 rapes and assaults on several prostitutes. After a bunch of prostitutes came forward, he ended up being formally arrested and charged with the 17 rapes and assaults. While he sat in jail awaiting trial for that, he was being investigated as the man that dropped these nine bodies and had left two missing women. DeGrazi was interviewed by the grand jury, but he was never charged for the murders along the highway. After 15 months in jail and 18 court appearances, DeGrazi was released on bail in January of 1990. The DA, Ronald Pena, had Anthony re-arrested because he was speaking in a bar, making threats of suing him for wrongful prosecution and imprisonment. Small town shit. He got back to the DA. The DA arrested him for that. DeGrazia was able to post bond. Later that week, he was found dead at his girlfriend's house under a picnic table of an apparent suicide which gave many of the investigating police officers peace of mind. They saw his suicide as the ultimate admission of guilt. Yeah. I mean, you, I could see that, but I could also see this ego-hungry DA having the guy killed, saying it was a suicide, acting like he solved the crime. You know what I'm saying? You got you a serial rapist. Maybe. He wasn't charged that, for it. You got somebody that'll take the heat off of you. He looks that way in public. Right. So then you got somebody that'll take the heat off of you. If I, if I kill this motherfucker, he's not going to talk anymore. Nobody will know shit. And the case is closed. Correct. Now, to complicate that case, you got this guy running around named Kenneth C. Ponty. 
He is a well-known attorney in New Bedford, not because of his great record, but because that boy is wild as hell. He's doing cocaine, banging heroin, doing real weird shit with prostitutes. What kind of weird shit? Living the American <laughs> dream, buddy. That's what kind of weird Peeing shit. Peeing on him? <laughs> uh, he doesn't... He gets prostitutes and he takes them to his house, gives them a bunch of drugs. Now, he yeah. is... Well, no shit. Well, yeah. I mean, I understand how the transactions work, but if you didn't have money, you wouldn't just give prostitutes drugs, right? Because he is... Uh, he works as an attorney, so he makes good money. He's got cash, but he spends it all on drugs. Now... Normally, you bring a prostitute, you do some drugs, you fuck the prostitute. Right. He doesn't have sex with them at all. None of them. He gets super paranoid on cocaine, and uh, he won't let them leave the house for fear of them causing attention to be drawn on him. And it was also alleged that he was a big-time drug dealer, which is, you know, probably possible. Yeah, yeah. Doing drugs, selling drugs, but coke paranoid, that's a motherfucker. Especially when you mix heroin and cocaine up and down, you get scared. And then you're sped up, and then you're sped up and scared. It's a mess. Not someone you want to be around. But anyway, I'm guessing his dick didn't work. You know what I mean? And he just couldn't fuck. So he On would, cocaine? But heroin also. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was blitzed out of it. He was Gigi Allen in it. Damn. Yeah. Was his dick that small? Gigi, man, Gigi's dick was small. Okay, here's a question <laughs> you guys can answer for us. Because I've, me and Buddy have talked about this for years. I say Gigi Allen just had the smallest dingus of all time. But he says that it's caused by opiates. My opiates make your dick small. I believe it. But that's a debate that you guys can solve. If you are medically inclined, hit us up. Deathmetaldicks at gmail.com. Weigh in on this. Did Gigi Allen just have a weird dick? Or did Gigi Allen have a sweet meat and then just bang to heroin too hard? And that boy went away. Boy, that dog with a dog house, man. Yeah, I'm we're going like, to do a G.G. Allen episode. It's going to be cool as fuck. Are we? Well, I don't know if I'm cool, but... <laughs> we should do a G.G. <laughs> hey, we're going to do a G.G. episode. I like G.G., man. No, you don't. He's a pedophile, man. I don't like him as a person, but G.G. And, <laughs> G.G. <laughs> G.G. and the Jabbers, man. That's a good... That's some good shit, man. I don't know, man. <laughs> the jury's out. <laughs> August 1990, a grand jury indicated Ponty in the murder of Rochelle... Doparella. That's the way I'm going to say it. That's a cool name, man. That's like an old rap name. Yo, it's me, Doparella, spitting dope rhymes, doing dope crimes, and dope, all that shit. I don't need no fella, because I'm dope a motherfucking rella. The new Bedford fucking salt and pepper. <laughs> Who had been beat to death? D.A. Ronald Pena. And that was, remember, the body that was not found directly off the highway? Mm-hmm. <laughs> D.A., Ronald Pena, went after him because he alleged that Ponty killed her because she was about to come forward about his drug activities. Damning evidence against him. Doparella's mom had stated that her daughter gave her Ponty's number in case she needed to reach her. Ponty said that he was just representing her in April 1988, right before her disappearance, but it was a case against her boyfriend that we talked about she said raped her. So he was going to take him to court, which really, he was probably just giving her a bunch of drugs and they were talking about a court case in his house while he was freaking the fuck out, you know? Ponty moved to Florida after entering a plea of absolutely not guilty and posting a $50,000 bond in March of 91. The D, or I'm sorry, posting a $50,000 bond. He's in Florida, March of 91. The DA dropped murder charges against Ponty, citing lack of evidence. In 92, the remaining charges, which were for drugs and assault, were dropped, and the case of the New Bedford Highway Killer went totally cold. Ponty came back to town in 2009, which really arose police suspicion, because when he was in Florida, he had been arrested twice for possession of crack cocaine. He got disbarred. for He had a client who died, and then one of the family members sued the other family members to get the money, won the case, and he kept $12,000 of the money for his personal use beyond what he was paid. So, I mean, obviously, he's a big old piece of shit. Came back to town in uh, 2009. So, what they ended up doing is digging up his old house, the driveway that had been put down since he had been there, underneath the porch. They didn't find anything. A month after they dug it up and didn't find anything... He went into the New Bedford Price Right, 
got arrested for stealing a block of cheese and four cans of sardines. You better make that feel good. <laughs> Jetta cheese dip. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine making cheese dip with microwaving cheddar cheese and sardines? Oh. <laughs> the sardine juice is what got the dip all lubed up. Oh, my God. Yeah, he met a sad end. Is that what he was doing, the prostitutes? <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, I got a problem. A sexual problem. Now, it's not like the BTK sexual problem right here. Listen to this. What I'm going to do here. I'm going to take a block of this here cheddar cheese. It doesn't melt very good in the microwave there, but listen here, I'm going to tell you how to make it melt good in the microwave there. Sardine juice. I take the sardine juice. I take the piece of the sardine. I put it in the microwave for 19 minutes. Okay, now it smells bad. Okay, listen, ladies. I understand ladies don't like bad smells, but this is a bad smell. And the only thing that gets me hot, only thing that gets Kenneth Ponte Esquire hard, diamond hard, blister and rock hard, is a lady smelling the smell of the sardine cheddar dip in a microwave. All right? I know, I know it's weird. I know it's weird. I know it's weird. But just hear me out, okay? I got a lot of cocaine, okay? You come to the house. You do the cocaine. I get diamond hard. And then I don't even do anything to you. I just put my dick in a hot cheddar. All right? That's what I'm going to do. Go ahead, Mary Beth. You over there with the pepperoni tits. You're up next. <laughs> <laughs> I love a pepperoni tit, man. You got pepperoni tits. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was a salams, man. Oh, man. Yeah, I got a round nipple. That's fine. That's normal. You know what your nipples do? They look like balls and they go <laughs> into your stomach. Why do your tits feed your stomach? How about you think about that before we talk some shit about tits? You're a man with saggers. Why do they sag? They sag My up. boys are perked up. Yeah, they are. All right, pull it up now. You show your tits all the time. No, don't sit weird. Sit up. Sit straight up. You see that shit? Yeah, your tits shrunk a lot, man. Oh, you've been on the testosterone. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, did you see YouTube users right now? Y'all saw Buddy's tits several times. Over the last few months. Testosterone works. Look at those things. Yeah, man. Look, those Mark. Good. They, your tits are disappearing. Your tits are in line with your stomach. I used to be able to produce milk, man. I can't, <laughs> I can't believe this shit. You still got a real pointy nipple, but yo, your tits are gone. Dude, if I play with my tits, they get hard as fuck, I got to get testosterone, man. Your tits are gone, bro. I mean, I got to, man, the other stuff's got to go. What the fuck? Yeah, got, you don't eat better or exercise. You can't expect, I, I can't believe exercise? your fucking tits are gone. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. God damn it. Exercise my right <laughs> to tell you to fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> you let freedom ring piece of shit. All right, so sat in for Kenneth Ponte. He just liked to have a good time, and he went out on a disgusting, fetid. Look at, see, all right. God damn it. You can't see it unless you're on YouTube, but buddies, dude, testosterone works. Gentlemen, if you got tits. Hit that T. I hey, gotta man. do it. I it's mean, a, it's a fucking game shark, dude, for your Nintendo 64, brother. You trying to get all the, and then, No, never mind. You trying to get the cheat code to that 007? Right. Test it. Listen, I got pictures of Buddy's weird tits on my Facebook. This exact picture. So if you're not a YouTube watcher, get on my Facebook and look at those goddamn tits. And I'm here to tell you today, after doing... Te you've been on testosterone for two months. You've two had months. two injections, right? Yeah. Those fucking tits are gone! I can't. I'm mad. All right, let's stop. Okay, <laughs> police found Kenneth Ponty in his shitty, fetid, fucked up apartment, dead, covered in shit and piss on a two mattresses stacked on top of each other. January of 2010, he died from an overdose. Oh my god! Wild, wild as hell. Now, these are two very viable suspects. I don't think Ponty did it because he was just a weird motherfucker. And the DA hated him. I mean, this is the type of attorney. You remember Rob Ford, that mayor in Canada? Cool as shit, smoking crack, being fat, living life hard. Living a hard life. But you know what Rob Ford did? That motherfucker went in there and balanced the budget in a way that this Canadian city's budget had never been balanced before. He did so good, he got caught with a prostitute smoking fucking crack and got reelected and didn't even say he didn't do it. He said he did it and he had a problem and he didn't say that he fixed his goddamn problem. He just kicked so much fucking ass that they reelected him. Rob Ford forever. This is that type of guy because he did a good job at being an attorney. And if you're a DA that's got his life together, going to church, wife and kids, busting ass all the time to make it to the top, and this fat fuck comes along banging cocaine and hookers 
and doing way better than you, you hate him. You fucking hate him. How are you fat and do cocaine? That's a great question. Ask Rob Ford and Kenneth Ponte. They're both fat as fuck. Kenneth Ponte, we have to do, a, we'll have to do another goddamn <laughs> seance to get that boy. Oh, no, I would love it. He rules. I, he didn't do shit, guys, all right? He was just living life hard, man. He was Rob Ford in it. He was an original Rob Ford. Shout out to Rob Ford. Shout out to Kenneth Ponte. Another very possible suspect. This is one that makes some of the most sense to me. Again, large Portuguese fishing community. I don't know anything about the Portuguese. I know a lot about Brazilians. Yeah. Brazilian jiu-jitsu, they speak Portuguese. I doubt there's any similarities. It's just like uh, how in Mexico they speak Spanish, which emanated from Spain. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not the same shit. Brazil, they speak Portuguese, settled by Portugal, all that type of shit. Portuguese people are probably way different than Brazilians. Brazilians, if you told me a Brazilian killed a bunch of prostitutes, I'll believe you right away. They're <laughs> fucking wild as hell. They just wear, they wear fucking Speedos and fucking Skechers oh, in public. Dude, let me tell you, B- Brazilians love fucking wilding out. They're wild. I love them. Wild. I'm I with it. Too, man. I, I mean, it, I trained man. with I tons it. of Brazilians. <laughs> they're just wild, man. They're, they're living life to the fullest. I, I hear it's from the, toxo, the toxoplas- toxoplasm. Yeah. It's cats? like yeah 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 it's like a cat thing it elevates your testosterone makes you aggressive and that's like a huge toxoplasmosis that's you got it my man look at you buddy lloyd dot biz but yeah it makes them wild they're fucking wild but anyway this guy um between 1992 and 1993 three prostitutes were slain and disemboweled with an instrument that was not a knife in lips in portugal now the only Concrete evidence I have on how these women were killed is that that was supposedly similar to how these women were found, disemboweled and slain. Huh. An unknown serial killer that was dubbed the Lipson Ripper, while two further prostitutes were shot dead on the opposite shore of the Tagus River in the same time period. In March 1993, two detectives of the Portuguese Policia Judiciaria traveled to New Bedford to gather information on the highway killings while two agents of the FBI traveled to Lips- Lisbon. Now, it's important to talk about this for our next episode. The FBI doesn't get involved in murders unless it's on federal property. Hmm. You knew that. We've talked about it plenty of times. If, if you have a string of murders, the FBI doesn't have shit to do with it. That's local jurisdiction. If it happens on federal property, highway, interstate, National Forests, specifically, the FBI will get involved because that's federal land. Following a hypothesis that the stream of crimes on both sides of the Atlantic could have been committed by the same individual, New Bedford has a sizable Portuguese community and many of the highway victims were of Portuguese ancestry. The Lipson murders were also linked to four similar killings that took place in Belgium, the Netherlands, Denmark, and the Czech Republic, all countries bordering Germany between 1993 and 1997, the theory being that the Libsyn Ripper had then become a long-haul truck driver. In 2011, a 21-year-old man named Joel applied to participate in the Portuguese edition of the reality show Secret Story, where participants try to guess each other's secrets while concealing their own. The secret he applied with was that his father, Jose Pedro Guedes was the lips and ripper. Guedes, 46, was arrested and confessed to the three slangs, but could not be prosecuted because murder had a prescription period of 15 years in Portugal and the last murders had ended in 2008. Guedes could still be prosecuted for the 2000 murder of a prostitute in Aviero, Portugal and similar murders in Germany or neighboring countries where Guedes resided in the 1990s. It is unknown, however, if Guedes ever resided in the United States. Guedes was charged was tried for the Aviero murder in 2013, found not guilty due to lack of evidence and released. The sentence noted that several details given by Guedes about the Aviero and Lisbon murders were inaccurate. So, wild shit going on in the world. Basically, the theory that makes one of the most sensical theories to me, and again, it could have been three or four people m- murdering various prostitutes. This guy is a fisherman. He traveled all around the world and then became a long-haul truck driver and drove around Germany. Easy, 
hardworking occupations that flow right into the next. Killed a bunch of people. His son knew about it and confessed it on a fucking game show. And then police went and arrested him. That's wild shit. That's wild That's fuck. wild shit. Interesting, but it turned out not to be him. Easily could have been him. We'll never know because it's unsolved. Neil Anderson caught the eyes of investigators. He was identified as being involved with assaulting and raping prostitutes in Weld Square during the highway killings. Anderson lived near the Weld Square area and was known to police. He was charged with rape and intent to rape for an incident on Coppercut Road in Dartmouth. He was indicted in an additional rape case that took place in the reservation in Fall River. He was interviewed by a grand jury, but interest in him waned off. Anderson was convicted in 1994 for aggravated rape and completing his sentence was held at the Massachusetts Treatment Center in Bridgewater for a year while prosecutors attempted to try to convince the court he was sexually dangerous. The court released him on September 20th, 2006. On August 16th, 2007, he is accused of robbing the Northeastern Savings Bank in Easton and on September 6th, 2007, robbing the Slade Bank in Swanisa. Anderson is also a suspect in the robberies of banks in Ranham, North Attleboro, and East Providence, Rhode Island. Lionel De Sosa, he was convicted and deported after a 1989 vicious attack and rape with a pipe and bottle, remember that beer bottle, Fort Tabor, at Fort Tabor in New Bedford. He was never interviewed by the grand jury, and he was immediately deported, not charged for the crime. Oh, my God. And again, given the sensationality of the disappearances, some people speculated that the killer could have been a transient who worked on a fishing vessel based in New Bedford. The killings may have been committed by someone from a migratory commercial fishing fleet that visited New Bedford between March and September, returning to San Diego. Very easily could have happened. I mean, that... The, of course, way to get away with a prolonged string of serial killing, Eileen Warnos, um... Why do I always forget this guy's name? Otis Tool, and uh, this is like the third time this has happened. It's uh, <laughs> it's a goddamn Otis joke. Tool and Henry Henry uh, Lee Lucas. Yeah, Henry Lee Lucas. They were drifters. They may or may not have killed hundreds of people, but they were on streak for forever. If you're drifting, truck driving, any type of job where you can make a living, but just be off the map for tons of time. So again, we talked about truck driving would have been the ultimate way. Now they have a digital logbook that checks you into everywhere you go. Thank God, because these fucking animal truck drivers can't get out and rape and murder everybody. But before that, when you just had a paper log, you didn't have to prove where you were at ever. You could just go out and stab and kill whoever you liked. Yep. Uh, during this investigation, a Missouri man who was once arrested on a fugitive and auto theft charges by Attleboro police was examined as a suspect. He actually bragged to a prison guard in Missouri that he killed the women while living out east. But he was ruled out after police determined his story was a ruse because his ex-wife lived out east and he was trying to be next to her. Right. Well, so he wouldn't just go kill people and then go back to his ex-wife? No, 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 no. He was try he was in prison for a long ass time. Yeah. And if they would have brought him back to interview him and take him around possibly being charged with the murders, he would have been near his ex-wife. That makes okay, sense? I got you. Yeah, so yeah. like when he got out of prison, he could have just been where she's at or she could have come and visited him. She's his ex-wife. She's not going to drive to Missouri to visit him. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, Bristol County District Attorney Ronald Pena, I think this is bullshit. He said his office received an anonymous letter two weeks before the second woman was found from a person who said he might have witnessed one of the killings and preceding a body which would be found along Route 88. Pena says the person who sent the letter said they had information and had seen what they believed to be a person who may have been doing these killings. He said he doesn't know if that is accurate, but what they did say is that if we found a body on Route 88, they would confirm their story. The letter was explicit, is what Pena said, and we had never had a body on Route 88 before in these cases. It sounded very good, but it doesn't fit. And then he goes on to say, now it fits, and the person said if it fit, they would come forward. Now, there's another serial killer that's pretty close to this that was the Route 88 serial killer, 
um, which we could definitely do an episode on because that boy was wild as fuck. And there are so many serial killers in the area at the time, too. Yeah. It's just so much that it could have been. It's Next, just, and it really seems like the uh, the mid '80s, all the way through, like the I mean, all the way to 1998, even like it's just a dude. It's just so many goddamn serial killers, slashing and compassion. compassion. Then this one is the wildest one to me. Uh, the Sassini brothers. They lived an hour away from the dump sites. Joseph Sakini was convicted of one rape. But he had been confused of a string of extremely violent and sadistic rapes and attempted rapes over a number of years. His uh, Joseph Sassini is now serving a life sentence in Georgia after he was convicted of rape, sodomy, and three aggravated assaults in 1989. In one case, he reportedly broke into a woman's home in Fayette County, Georgia, put a pillowcase over her head, and attempted to rape her. In the most heinous attacks, Sassini reportedly forced his way into a church and raped the minister's wife. Metal. Yeah, I mean, now I don't want to say cool. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, but, man. Fuck. It's not cool. It's but hard. No, it's not cool, but. It's metal. Okay. Is, <laughs> we'll is, take that. Is metal cool? Uh, don't do this to me, man. We're yeah, on the air right I now. I got you, man. There's thousands of people listening. I got you. Fuck my ass. He is convicted for an attack in Georgia, but he's back in Massachusetts. Before then, he had gotten arrested for burglary in Massachusetts. His brother, Alex Sassini, was convicted of just one murder of a prostitute in 2012, but court records show Sassini had a history of violence against women that stretches out for more than a decade. In cases dating back all the way to 1996, Sassini was charged with beating a woman known to be a prostitute, allegedly raping and trying to strangle a woman, and allegedly raping a girl under the age of 16. In each case, the charges were either reduced or dropped when the woman did not appear in court. Sassini is <coughs> being held in Worcester County Jail on rape and attempted murder charges for allegedly sodomizing a female friend in March 2007 and trying to smother her with a pillow, but the woman escaped. What the fuck? A lot of motherfuckers out this there wild, that could have done it. I know, and it's just shitty police work. But we're going to be the right type of cops and link this all to Satan next week. Oh, we're going to, listen, we're going to crack this motherfucker. We're going to crack this shit wide open, my guy. We're going to crack this shit open like a mortician in an old cold. Bum, bum, <laughs> bum, 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 bum. There's men. Bum, 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 bum. There's all the kids. Bum, 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 bum. And they're going to do what they have to do it. Special shout out to all our patrons. You guys help us out so much. Give us tons of motivation. We've gotten stickers thanks to you. We're going to get shirts thanks to you. I love you guys so much. Every dime we get helps. It's just great to know that someone enjoys what we're doing so much that they're willing to give some of their hard-earned money to us with good faith that we'll deliver more of our product to them. Thank you, guys. We love you. Alan Gaden, Bobby Hens, Matt Mess, Ryan Parker, of course, who again suggested this case. That could be you. Brian Wiley, Becca Bradshaw, Brad Bradshaw, Amber Bradshaw. We love the Bradshaws. You yeah, guys are cool as hell, and they're in our state. Jeffrey Ross, also from our state. Michaela Janisicki, also in our state. And Jennifer Vale. Patrons, thank you guys so much. You make this all worth doing. You keep us going. And if you guys want to join that list, patreon.com backslash death metal dicks. If you have any suggestions from stuff you want from us, we're all here for it. Yeah. I've got 13 full notebooks that I filled out so far. I know people that like metal like to collect memorabilia. If a notebook is something you would like to have, we can certainly arrange it. If you don't like the subscription service, again, we'll do all types of shit for you. Actually, dude, I got an email from this lady who was trying to pitch us on the, us recording greetings and sending it to fans of our podcast. First of all, I hate the term fans, but she was trying to third wave service selling people that listen to our podcast on us sending them personalized greetings. So I'm sure that they would charge something for the service. So you know what? We'll just cut that goofy shit out. And we would definitely be happy to make a voicemail greeting for you or send you a video personalized for your birthday or your friend's birthday, whatever. Just hit us up. We can sort that out. Yeah, man. Absolutely, dude. That's cool. It's fun as hell. Uh, I hope you guys have liked the many interviews we've been doing. 
Something I can tell you is that the first one, dog shit quality, we did it on Skype, no idea how to do it. Second one, sounds pretty all right. We talked to the guy on the phone, we weren't sure how to do it. I think we have the technique, not perfected, but a better system of doing it. We're going to interview James, the singer of Hard Way, Harm. Hard Harm's Way. It's hard, so it's yeah hard. So I want to say hard way. Harm's Way. Kick-ass hardcore band. I'm excited about Chug that. Chug a lug in it. I'm going to talk to him tomorrow. And I'll put that out this week. So another mini episode interview for you guys. We're trying to keep the content streaming along. You know what I mean? Yep. We love you. We're excited to do more with you. And we'll talk at you next week. The song for this week is... uh, Prostitute Disfigurement. Very fitting. She's Not Coming Home. That's the name of the song. If you look these lyrics up, they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, you could give them a line. All right. Just don't read the whole thing. <laughs> uh, she went out for a cuddle and a kiss. She was beaten up and picked up for a horrible ride. She vanished off the street one cold December night. And then the rest of it is all downhill. <laughs> yeah, check it out. Uh, of course, that's going to be the song featured in the o- intro and outro prostitute dismemberment she's not coming home disfigurement fucking fuck i can't get words right today Errol! check them out hail satan as always it's important to tell you guys here's what satanism is all about here's what chaos magic is all about here's what living the life you want to live all about motivational speakers fake multi-level marketing fake you're in control of yourself How are you going to get your goals done? Well, think about all the things you can control in your life. Control them. That's it. That's what you're doing physically, carnally, ignoring your spiritual side, because it's not real. Grasp it. That's Satanism. Chaos magic, having a strong belief in yourself. Believing in what you want to get done. There's no magic secret. Mm. There's no formula. There's no 10 easy steps. You write your own goddamn story. You just do the things that you can do. Hail Satan. Shout out to our wives on Valentine's Day for putting up with our dumb asses. Oh, yeah. We're fucking (laughs) idiots. We love you guys. Uh, Thanks for letting us come on you. That's something that most people wouldn't do. So happy Valentine's Day. Eat ass forever. Good night. Man, that fucking... <laughs> that was with, a good one. That was a real good one. Yeah, that one's wild, dude. That one's wild as shit. I tried to find all yeah. kinds of stuff on like YouTube just to watch so I yeah. kind of know something, and I couldn't find shit. Yeah, um, there was a really good...